given. Amen. 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 We're going to turn to pray. At this point, we're going to lift the teacher for tonight, Pastor Lambo, who will be leading us in the Bible, for the Bible study tonight. We pray that our Almighty God will speak through him. We will give him the, 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 the strength, the power, the wisdom, the authority as he prepared to bring the word out. It is not by his power, not his strength, but we ask in the Lord tonight that he speaks through him. He used him tonight for the Bible study tonight. Let us pray for Pastor Lambo, the teacher for tonight's Bible study. Let us pray. Father Almighty God, everlasting and Jehovah God, we come before your presence tonight. And for tonight's Bible study, we lift your servant, Pastor Lambo, into your hands into your throne, my Lord, my God, as you prepare to bring the word out for your children. Lord, I pray that you give them the utterance. Yeah. You give them the power and the authority yeah. that comes from you, the strength that comes from you, the wisdom that comes from you, the knowledge that comes from you. It's not his yeah. own wisdom, not his own power, not his own strength. But Lord, the strength that comes from you. Mm -hmm. That everything that comes from you, that you have ordained to your servant. Lord, continue to bless him. Mm -hmm. Continue to empower him and, and uplift him. Mm -hmm. As he committed his life for your work, for your kingdom work. Yes, sir. Father, many, many blessings for him. And as we are about to begin the Bible study tonight and he's leading us, this will be the best Bible study. Because through you, as you speak through, through him, there will be more excitement. There will be more participation. There will be more enjoyment for this Bible study tonight. We thank you. We bless your holy name. With the Lord, have it in your way. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray tonight. Amen. 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 Father Almighty God, we thank you for tonight. You have given us another opportunity to come together again to study your word. And Lord, my God, we, we do not take it for granted. We do not take it lightly. Because this is another important part of your kingdom word. We must know the word. We must study the word. We must equip ourselves with the word. And the only way we do it is when we come together like this and study the word. Uh, continue to empower us. Give that, give it, give it that spirit, the spirit of learning of your word. <coughs> Let tonight be an exciting night. Let tonight be the night that it will be a remarkable night of what we are about to say. We bless your holy name. But uh, take us through from the time we begin to the time we begin. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much, Elder Abeng, for your powerful prayer every time. May God bless you too. Uh, good evening, Church. Um, let us pray. Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, once again for bringing us together tonight to study your word. Father, O oh Lord, into your hands, O oh Lord, we commit everything that we are going to study tonight. Father, I beseech you, O Lord, to give me your trance, O Lord. Speak through me, Father. Make me a channel of communication to your children, Father. Anoint your message, O Lord, and consecrate all the hearts that will hear this message this evening, O Lord. We beg you, Father Almighty, by the time we complete this study, O Lord, let all of us, O Lord, be spiritually filled and excited because you, we belong to you. We thank you, O Lord, for giving us this opportunity. We thank you, O Lord, for giving us this privilege. In the name of your Son, O Lord Jesus Christ, Father, we pray. Amen. Yeah, good evening, Church. Tonight, we are going to discuss one of the most controversial uh, subjects uh, in the Christendom, especially in the Bible, and uh, how we perceive it, how 
um, in the in the last 400 years how some people had mis misinterpreted it the difference between servant slave is there any difference between a slave and a servant and are there any particular race of people that should be servant or that should not be servant and what was the origin of uh, slavery what are the origins of of um, servanthood and why is it um, a, a condoning the bible was was really god in support of slavery so so these are all the questions these are all the other things that we shall be studying tonight and by the time we finish it i'm very very sure that most of us will be uh, completely enlightened and I will be able to know exactly what the, the the Bible is trying to teach us. Because when you go back to this to the letter of uh, Apostle Peter in that uh, First Peter um, chapter two, chapter two uh, from verse, that verse thirteen, he starts with submission to government. Then 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 from chapter eighteen uh, verse eighteen verse 18 that chapter 2 is a submission to masters so 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 it is it is a question of submission 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 and if we are because we cannot understand really uh, if we're going to start from because i'm supposed to start from verse 18 but if, if i start right from verse 18 without going back again to refresh our memory from what our general Vasya taught us last wednesday about in the meaning of submission to government it will be difficult for us to follow up in verse 18 in, in, from verses 18 and that verse 13 it says therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the lord's sake whether to the king as a supreme or to the governor or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of those who do good for this is the will of god that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men then he said as free that is verse 16 he said as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice but as bond servant of god honor all people love the brotherhood fear god honor the king then then submission to masters starting from verse 18 he said servants be submissive to your master with all fear not only to the good and to gentle but also to the harsh for this is commendable if because of conscience towards god one endures grief suffering wrongfully but what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently but when you do good and suffer if you take it patiently this is commendable before god for to this you we are called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps he now justify the reason why we must be submissive from verse 22 he said who committed no sin which is jesus nor was deceit found in his mouth who when he was revived did not revive in return when he suffered he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sin might live for righteousness but whose stripes you were healed for you were like sheep going astray but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul so this is what apostle peter wrote in in uh, <clears throat> in that first first peter chapter 2 according to the niv which is the the new king james version but when we now come down to to the level of um of um, uh, <clears throat> um average readers especially today's english today's english it explains it further for us it explains it further for us it's because he said he said for the lord's sake submit to all human authority whether it's the king as the head of the state 
or to officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. So it is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. So for you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. Now, so we now say slaves. So anything you serve and here, he says slaves in verse 18. He said you are slaves or you who are slaves must submit to your master with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel to you. For God is pleased when, conscious of his way, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sin in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wander away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your soul. Now, the big question now is, is Apostle Peter writing to the Jews? Or write to a particular race of people. It's because one thing we, we gather from this writing is that it's, it's writing to, to, to the Jews, and the Jews are not Africans, they are not black people. They are Caucasian too. So that so that so that just, so we have to debunk from our own mind once and for all tonight that. Servant slaves does not refer to us to as, as uh, black people at all, even though some people may start to use it. So let, let us now look at it in the context that Apostle Peter is not writing to all Christian believers, whether you are race, whether you are uh, white, whether you are black, whether you are uh, uh, Mexican, whether you are Arab, whether you are anything. And then it will be possible for us to, to be able to, to really get something from it. Now, the general Basia try as much as possible to enlighten us, to explain to us that what, what Apostle Peter was, was telling us about how we can be submissive to those in authority. He said because it is God's design, it is, it is it's part of God's plan. Plan, and God ordained it. God, it was God that set up. The, 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 the king, the kingship. Because if you remember, before before the, the uh, before before the uh, uh, um, introduction of kingship in, in, in the world, the the, 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 the prophets were the one ruling, and the last prophet was was prophet Samuel. And if you remember, when when the people asked Samuel, give us a king, Samuel was annoyed. Samuel was trying to tell them that if I give you a king, it's going to make your children slave, it's going to make your children husband, it's going to make your children soldiers. They said, we want a king. And God told Samuel, give them a king. This is not you that they rebel against, but they rebel against me. So, so, that, so that, that, that was the time that Samuel gave them the first king, which is, which is a, 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 a Saul from, from the tribe of Benjamin. And we all knew the story about how Saul did before eventually he came to David. So that so that so that so that so that we have 
we have people in authority which are ordained by God. And then also, even before, before, before uh, the, the, the um, existence of uh, Samuel or, or the prophets, immediately after they left Egypt, if you still remember again, when they were in the wilderness, the, 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 the father-in-law, Jethro, of uh, uh, um, Moses, he said, is, look among, among, among these people, the people who are faithful to you, the people who could be trusted, so, so that they can be in charge of 50, in charge of 100, in charge of 500. Make them judges. Otherwise, you will be born out. So that, so that that was the beginning of delegation of authority. So that, so that it was ordained by God that we must have authority. And that's why Apostle, um, Apostle Peter is trying to say that those people that, that they are now in charge of you, authority in authority, obey them, respect them. And that's why we have in every organization, religious organization, we have the hierarchy of those in authority to whom we must respect. And the same respect goes to, to, to the homes too, in which the Bible says that as Christ is the head of the church, so is a man the head of the home. And so the same thing goes again to our place of work, in which all of us, one, one time or the other, we, were, we have served under a master. So, so Apostle Peter is saying, obey them, respect them. But it does not say that you must rebel against the ones that are wicked or they are weak or that they are very, very uh, cruel because all of us, we have gone through so many um, uh, supervisors, so many masters, so many uh, uh, people in authority during our lifetime. Some have been kind to us, some have been very wicked and exploitative to us. But how do you differentiate yourself as a Christian? when you are under such situation. So before we now start uh, 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 treating that uh, verse 18, as we shall be concluding the whole of uh, um, uh, chapter 2 tonight, that is to, to, to 25. So let us just have a, a quick rundown, a summary of the whole thing that we, are, that we have studied. He said, how Christians live on this side of eternity does in fact matter. Because he said, you are strangers. First Peter, he said, establish who we are as God's people. Though faith in Christ, he said, it describes why believers are called by God to lead holy lives. Different from those in the world around us. Because we are set apart. God has set us aside for a different purpose. Peter now begins to get specific about what looks like in that our dates today reality. He began by telling Christians to put away some specific negative attitudes and actions. Instead, we are to grow our appetite for the pure spiritual food available in Jesus. We must never spend valuable time in idle gossip, in loss, in indulgence, in this, in that. That is what he started to say. So, so why does that matter? Because Jesus is the long prophesied cornerstone or the foundation stone in the new spiritual house which God is building. And Jesus is the chosen and the precious one. So those who trust in him are also living stone in this house as the general overseer explained to us. They are a holy priesthood, each one serving in the house with a responsibility to offer themselves as spiritual sacrifices. And that is why God did not make all of us to have one spiritual gift alone. God created all of us with different, different, different spiritual gifts that, that, that make the body of Christ, that glorify the church. And he, he downloaded or he gave this endow these gifts to each one, each one according to how we can manifest it. So those who reject Christ are destined to stumble over him. But those who trust in him will receive honor with him. So we have been called out of the darkness that all others remain in. And unto God's light. 
so that it matters all the more that we lead good lives now. Not because we might lose God's mercy, we will not, but because we represent him to the world around us. And that is why they say we are the light of the world. And that scripture says that a, a, a light set on the on, on the on the mountain cannot be hid. So, so which means that the moment you become a Christian, a born again Christian, they want to see Christ reflected in you. And that's why some people give testimony that, that somebody came to me and said, Are you a pastor? I think it was my general was here that said so. Because they saw Christ in him. It's, it, they, they, they saw that it is different from the rest of people. And that is what, when you start building a relationship with Christ, you don't even have to announce yourself as a pastor before somebody asks you, are you a pastor? Because the way you talk is different, the way you act is different, the way you behave is different. They see Christ in you. So Peter insists that we must change our understanding of where home is where is your home? We must begin to see ourselves as foreigners in the world, preparing to live, to be with our Father. It's not easy to live that way. In Christ, we have been forgiven for our sin, and we have been freed from sin's power to tempt us to do evil. Even though, and as long as we still remain the carnal flesh, Temptation abounds every day of our life. And that is why the Lord gave us that Lord's prayer. Save us from temptation. Every day we, we, we recite the Lord's prayer because we are tempted every day. So, but we still want to sin. But the desire to do wrong, which is war against our own souls. We must engage in the battle with ourselves. Now that we have the ability to win it, thanks be to God, we have the ability to win, to win sin, to win, to win the war against sin. So one aspect of that battle with ourselves is submission to human authority. One aspect of that battle is to submit ourselves to human authority. What does that mean? It's simple. Son, Obey your father. Congregation, obey your pastors. Pastors, obey your general overseer. Supervisors, obey your boss. So, so these are all simple, simple, simple things. And Peter's readers at that time must have felt that they had legitimate reason to rebel against human leadership because when, when, when uh, 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 um, the Bible says that you are now free in Christ, that you are now free in Christ, it does not give us liberty, liberty to do whatever we want. Because if you remember again, it, 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 uh, um, Apostle, Apostle Peter, Apostle, Apostle Paul, he wrote in... in um, Efficient. He said, neither he said, neither not, not, neither Jew nor 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 uh, uh, Gentiles. He said because he, he wrote it in Galatians 3, 26 to 29. He said, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So that's neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor is there male or female for you are all in christ jesus if you belong to christ then you are abraham's seed and here according to the promise this one was completely not not rejected but it was it was it was a, a, a kind of a, a hard uh, 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 discipline or instruction for 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 the for the rich people of those of those uh, uh, early Christians to swallow. Now, what what is Apostle Paul trying to say here? Because in uh, because in in the, in, the, in the Roman setting, the culture allow 
them to keep slaves. They have so many slaves. And even, even in the Christian community, they, they kept slaves. Or even in the, in the Jewish community, they kept slaves because God gave them the, 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 the opportunity to wage war and capture some people as slaves. So now, now so and, and this was the boat of contention between between the Jewish the, the, the Mosaic law and, and the new doctrine, which is Christianity. And that is where Christianity run a, 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 a parallel. It, it, it run against any 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 norm. Because the Romans, the Romans believe in slavery. The, the Jewish believe in slavery. The Gentiles believe in slavery. Now, when you now, now, when, when now become a Christian, you are now telling me that my slave should now be attending the same synagogue with me. That my slave should now be sitting on the same dining room table with me. That my slave should not, be, should not be sharing the same benefit with me. It was difficult for them. It was difficult for them to, 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 to swallow. But that is what Apostle Paul is saying here. So, 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 that, so that, that is what we, we, we I, 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 and this thing did not even stop over there. It, it even prevails up to today. Because if you still remember, in the, in the uh, immediately after the uh, the declaration of uh, 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 emancipation of slave trade, the white people refused to allow the black people to enter the same bus with them. The white people refused to allow any black people to go to to come to classroom with them. Even to today, there are some there are some areas in which you cannot go. But even though that is racialism, that's nothing to do with what Apostle Paul is saying here. Because, because the people that are calling, uh, they are called slaves here are not black people. They are also Jews, they are also from different, different countries. But that is the way they interpreted it over here. And they try to justify slavery. So we are going to go into all these things and, and people will be able to ask questions. People will be able to ask questions. So, so, so that, so that, so Peter is clear. Christians must submit to every human authority, whether the emperor, whether the governor, or the slave master. And this does not mean obeying all that human authority tells us to do. As the general Basia said, no. He said, you, you, you have to obey, but not when, when, when the, the, the instruction or the, the, or the, 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 the a, a, um, order is to go against your conscience or against God. Because if, if you remember correctly, he cited the example of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. When Nebuchadnezzar built his uh, 70 feet uh, golden, gold, golden image and said, everybody must bow down. And Shadrach, Shadrach Meshach, Abednego, they say, no, we will not bow down to your golden image. If we die, we die. They refuse. So, so, so it means that it means that you as a Christian, you still have the right to reject because as he said, he said you must fear, you must never fear those that can kill the flesh alone, but fear those people that can destroy the flesh and both the soul. And what that's God, that's Christ. So that is what we are seeing here. Because Potiphar's, uh, Potiphar's wife he invited Joseph now. Joseph said, no, I'm not, I will not do that to my master. She was the, she was the missus. She has the authority to command Joseph the slave because Joseph was a slave to her. But she, he disobeyed her. So, so which means that, so that it's not every authority, not every command, not every... Uh, 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 instruction that you must carry out. Any instruction that is going to go against your conscience, against God that you are serving, you can reject it. The worst thing they can do is to behead you. And that is why he's saying that it is joy to die for, for standing upon your ground and be justified before God. 
So now going further, Peter says that all Christians are called to suffer for doing good. That's what Christ, our example, did for us when he suffered on the cross. He did not retaliate or daring. He endured the pain and sadness of his suffering and took our sins on himself, dying the death we deserved. We didn't ask him to do it. But we would still be lost sheep if he had not. Because he did, we are under the protection and care of our shepherd and Lord. Now, he is saying that Jesus Christ died for us. He suffered on the cross because of our sin, even though we did not ask him to do that. But if Christ died for us, then it means that we we have to end, we, we are, and we are his followers, and, and the slave cannot be more than the master. So, so which means that we have to do whatever he asks us to do. So that is what he is saying here. Because otherwise, if you remember, Peter is, is now saying that you have to obey the emperor. And the emperor was a very, very, very wicked man, Emperor Nero. We read about him. He was the one throwing all the Christians into the lion's den. So how do you want to, uh, uh, how do you want to obey such a wicked man? And then we have the um, we have we have the governors, Agrippa, uh, Governor Governor Felix. All of them were all there. Herod King. All of them were there because uh, if you still remember the life of the life history of John the Baptist, he did not deny God. He did not. He he, he, he maintained his his gospel before before. Uh, Herod's wife asked for, for the head of John the Baptist through, through her daughter. So, so we have so many, so many examples of, of, of all these challenges that we have read about. So, 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 that, so that now coming back to that uh, um, uh, verse, 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 verse um, 18 now. He said, which you read, he said, he said, he said, you are slaves. You who are slaves must submit to your master with all respect. Do what they tell you. Not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel to you. For God is pleased when conscious of his will. You patiently endure unjust treatment. And this one reminds me, of the story we did, we we've already told before about about David and the woman they call Abigail, the wife of Nabal. When David was running away from from the persecution of King Saul, David sent some some of his men to the house of Nabal for bread, for for water, and everything. And, and Nabal said, who is the son of David that I should, that I should kill any of my sheep? Even though David protected his sheep, David protected his, uh, his uh, servants from, from, the, from the armed robbers that came to invade them. But what did Abigail do, his wife? If you still remember, David said, okay, I will, I will go to the house of Nabal. And I swear that not a single male will remain. I will kill all of them. Abigail was was his wife, but a slave, a, a, like 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 she was given in in return for a loan. So 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 so, 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 so that she was more or less a slave, but but but, but like a, a, a wife to Naba. Abigail quickly gathered bread, cake, everything, water. Is she sneaked out? to go and meet David on his way to come and slaughter them and beg David that what, 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 that, what is the death of a, a, a sinner going to do for you? That you are the king, you are going to be the king of Israel. Don't soil your hand with the blood of this uh, the government. So, 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 so she played the part of a good wife. And this is what we expect from our, 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 our mothers, our, 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 our young ones, that sometimes your husband may make a, a wrong decision. It is for you to quickly, 
to quickly amend that situation before it escalates. You are to dis escalate as a wife in the house. You don't add petrol, you don't add gasoline to the inflammable situation. Your husband may have problem, may have quarrel with his family. But you as a wife is to de-escalate it. You are the one to play the, the role that Abigail played in saving that situation. Not to encourage him. So this is this is the role that 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 that, that we are talking about tonight. That that Peter discusses how this submission works itself out in the less than ideal circumstances in which most of us find ourselves. Slaves, submit yourself to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considered, but also to those who are harsh to you. Many Christians in the first century were slaves. Here Peter refers specifically to house slaves, members of the household, domestic servant and we have them today too and if you still remember again the story about uh, that we have already read in philemon onesimus onesimus was a slave to philemon and he ran away they didn't, they didn't tell us what he did and when you when you catch a slave that run away they either cut off his hair or they cut off one leg or they do something, they mark him. But what did Apostle Paul do? Apostle Paul wrote a letter to Philemon, his best friend, to plead, to plead for Philemon, to, to plead for Onesimus. He said, he said, he, he, he wrote it in, in, in Philemon, uh, uh, ten to eleven. He said that I appeal to you for my son. He called Onesimus the slave, my son. And in those days, before you call somebody your son, especially in the Jewish context or Greek context, that person must either be your, 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 your student that is very, very close to you. So he becomes your son. So he said, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who, because, who became my son while I was in chain. Formerly, he was useless to you. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. So, so he was returning Onesimus to Philemon. Not, not no more as a refugee, no more as, 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 a, as, as, as a runaway slave, but now he's coming back as a born again Christian, as a, a believer. He has been transformed by Jesus Christ into a new creature. So it's now becoming a new creature in Christ, becoming more useful to, to Philemon. So that's why Apostle Paul adopted him as his own son. So that is what we are now saying that in the first century, slavery, slavery was very common. While people weren't as often being taken into slavery in war and conquest, many had been born to slave parents. Not every slave were captured in during the slavery. But, but when you now keep a slave for a long time, they start bring, bringing children. And all the children of the slaves are also slaves to the master. So, 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 so that we have the white people, so, 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 that, so that, that, that is what, so they will be paid something, but we are not free to live unless they could purchase their full submission or paper. So, so, that, so that in those days, you can, you can, you, 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 you can work to pay off your debts, you can buy you can buy your citizenship because if you still remember again the centurion that was beating uh, apostle paul he asked apostle paul say are you a roman citizen he said i am a, a citizen of no man's citizen that is that i'm born i'm born a citizen of rome paul of paul of tarsus and the centurion said but i bought my own citizenship so that so that so that so that, so that this is what the apostle so that many slaves were well educated and served their masters in highly responsible trades and professions. And we are going to find out the, the, what, what really the, the history, the context, 
the, the, the way slavery or, or sour is being used here. You see, to American minds, coming back home now, to American minds, the word slave reminds us of the horrible condition suffered by African slaves in America, which is probably the wrong picture. It's the completely wrong picture. For the most part, slaves were well treated in the Roman Empire and laws protect them. Perhaps Sawa carries the appropriate level of meaning. Most of Peter's comments are applicable to the relationship between employer and employee. Most of Peter's comments command respect, respect, fear, difference. <coughs> so now, so what we are now saying now, it, 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 it's... Um, In, in, in that verse 18, if we are to submit to our employers and respect them, what is that saying about God's expectation that we do a good job? In what sense do we dishonor God when we don't give our full efforts to our job? So the question we are asking now is, what do we really understand as Christians that, that God expectation that we do a good job when we submit to our employers and respect them. If we are to submit to our employers and respect them. The question now is, what is God's expectation that we do a good job? That's one. And then in what sense do we dishonor God when we don't give our full effort to our job? Can, can somebody give me that answer? Let us let us let us answer it in a broad. It is not strictly part, uh, uh, referring to employer and employee. Let, let us say in the church too. The, the general vice is supposed to be the head of the church, and he delegates authority to all. So, what is God's expectation? What is God's expectation that we do a good job, which is one. And then, in what sense do we dishonor God when we don't give our full effort to our job? Can somebody give, give us a, a, an explanation on that one? How do we please God when we are in a position of, of, of uh, uh, um, not, not in position of authority, but in, in position of, of being servient? That is servant leader, servant, uh, servant leadership. How do we honor God by doing our job? Or how do we dishonor God by refusing to do our job? What does God expect from us? In any situation, we find ourselves serving other people. Hey, Rabeng. Hello. Nobody wants to answer. <laughs> Nobody wants to answer tonight. <laughs> how do we please? How do we please God? By by by. So how do we please God? Especially in the church, when the general overseer gives authority, gives everybody assignment, 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 assignment. Should the general overseer go back again, start going back again to check whether his job is being done? Or should the general overseer have that confidence that once I've already given this job out, I don't have to have any headache or stress to start monitoring everybody? So what does God really expect from us? Because you, when you when you are in the place of work that you are paid that you can be fired, the, the, the boss gives you minimum supervision. And should it, should, should it also uh, uh, be the same thing in the church or at home? Yeah, I'm listening to you, Auntie Mary. Uh. Yeah, I'm listening to you because one thing is when you are given an assignment in, the, in, in your place of work, where you know that you can be fired if you don't do it. And sometimes 
I have found myself in, in, in a situation where I have to meet target dates. Because, because as a, as a Q, as a country surveyor or, or a, a, a developer, I'm, I'm always giving target dates to meet. So, so which means that I don't have, I don't, I don't have any excuse to not to meet that target date because it, I know it's going to cost the investor and it's going to cost me too. So I work like a jackass. But when I come to church now, should we also have the same zeal? Should we also have the same, uh, 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 shall I say fear or shall I say commitment or shall I say uh, 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 fear to please God? So how, how do you reconcile, how do you reconcile this situation? What should be our attitude as Christian? Hmm? That's right. Is it a compulsory obligation that we must do it? Thank you so much. Anyway, <clears throat> things are pretty easy when your boss is wise and honest. But what about the fool, the incompetent and the morally bankrupt boss? Have you ever worked for one of them? Slaves submit to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong? If you do wrong, they beat you, you, you justify it. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. And we've read that one before too, the that history of Joseph. Joseph didn't do anything, but he was in prison for seven years. And so many cases like that. So that, that, that's what he's now saying, that, that figuratively it means pertaining to be morally bent or to say crooked or uh, uh, dishonest bosses. I don't think Peter is talking especially about physically violent bosses. Because you cannot stand a, a boss that is going to slap you. Mm -mm. No, it's not talking about that one. Even though we have seen that before too. So he mentioned a beating in verse 20. I think he's talking about those who are cruel or fear, who don't appreciate your hard work. We have, all of us must have suffered that kind of situation before. I suffered that kind of situation many, many times. But I endure. Because I knew that everything that has a beginning must have an end. But why I was suffering, I didn't know. But God was preparing me for a better things to come. And I thank God I'm in Manzanian Fellowship Church today. Getting my reward for all the years of pain, all the years of, 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 of uh, 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 suffering that I have been going through. So that is what the Bible is saying here. Yeah, it is difficult to preach unless you two have gone through that kind of experience before in your life. So bosses who promote their favorites and pass over others. Bosses who take advantage of their authority to intimidate and bombast their workers. Bosses who don't pay fairly, crooked, morally bankrupt bosses. Peter makes it very clear here that the standard for our attitude and behavior is God's pleasure. We work for God's delight. So we must never, so we must never lose courage. That is what the Bible is saying here. We are to submit to them in those things for which they rightfully direct our actions. But when they ask us to go against our conscience, against God's commands, their authority to command ends. So, so, so we draw a line there. 
We must humbly decline, no matter what the consequences. We live our lives conscious of God's, with that spiritual awareness of God's presence with us. We can live as children of God in that place. We can continue on in spite of its pressure, bear up under pressure. So now that question number three comes, how does being an employee conscious of God affect the way we act and react to injustice in the workplace? Can a conscientious Christian <clears throat> be a complainer? Why and why not? How do you usually react to prolonged unfair treatment at your work? How does being an employee conscious of God affect, affect the way we act and react to injustice in the workplace? If you are, if you are an employee, if you are an employee, how does the conscious of God affect the way you treat people? That is number one. And then number two, can a conscientious Christian be a complainer? Why and why not? How do you usually react to prolonged unfair treatment at your place of work? How many of us have gone and undergone that kind of situation before? How did we react? Do we have the right to complain? Can anybody answer us? Or as a boss, out of the consciousness of God, that direct you the way you conduct your business, the way you, you treat other people. Mr. Yes, sir. Can, yes, sir. I can, I can only think of two examples in the Bible to answer your question. To answer your question. Okay. In the book, and to ask, you know, it's Daniel and Joseph. That's right. That's right. Anything bad has to be charged, has to be given about because, you know, imagine, if, you know, they carry out an investigation on you as a leader, you know, would you stand the test? That's you know, right. would you stand up to that kind of scrutiny? That's right. You know, without some kind of scandal or corruption being uncovered? Because when you look at Daniel, for example, Daniel stood up to the scrutiny to the point where his enemies could only say, he prays too much. They try to find everything about Daniel because of the position he was, but he was not corrupt. He did everything according to, to the book. That's right. And so because when they didn't like him, they tried to set him up. But the only way they could set him up was because he prayed too much. He's too faithful to God. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? You know, and I think we have to live as don't we want to have that kind of excellent testimony before the world? You know, and it, it, it is achievable because remember that God wants us to be holy and be holy and he gives us the resources to achieve victory. And so again, Joseph and Daniel demonstrated that. That they even tried to set them up. Their, their political world didn't like them. But guess what? They stood to God. Now we saw, you know, we saw with Joseph, we saw what happened. And result became the prime minister of Egypt. With Daniel, we saw what happened. That you know, God shot the mouth of the lion and even the king who put him there said, you know, began to praise his God. So again, that, that you know, what, what is the motivation for excellent behavior? You know, it is need to get respect. That's right. need to impress other Christians how spiritual, how spiritual we, how spiritual we are. Mm -hmm. You know, it need to get some happy rewards. Um, what we want to do is to reflect God's grace to the lost world so that God will be glorified. That's right. Okay. And that's the chief end of God, each and every one of us as believers, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So Daniel, Joseph, and our Apostle Paul, in the New Testament, all the same thing God we are doing in their books today, they have glorified God's name. And I will enjoy Him forever. And because of the struggles they went through, because of their endurance, that's you know, today we have benefited from their work. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Amen. Thank you so much, sir. 
So <clears throat> to round up um, this concept about slavery and servant and uh, 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 and uh, the how it has been misinterpreted or misconstrued, uh, I, I just want to to run down to bring everything back home to our daily life in the, in the in the modern life that we are living now. You know, in, in Ephesians six five to seven, they said, "Servant, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling." In singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Paul repeated himself almost word for word in the third chapter of his epistle to the Colossians. So, so, like, like uh, we are saying that that if you are given an assignment in the church, you you, you don't do it to please the general overseer. Whether it's supervising you or it's not supervising you, when the assignment is given, you do it diligently. It does not have to call you many, many times to remind you on the phone. Once you are a head, a leader in charge of a ministry, you are deemed to be self-sufficient to carry out your responsibility because that assignment was given to you because they trust, they, they feel that you are capable of handling that responsibility. And also, when you, when, when you receive a call, you owe that response, you owe that duty to call back. And we, we, are, we are getting indulged in one bad practice, which is not good. People, the pastors will call, people will call you, you will see their missed call, and you don't call back for two days, for three days. It's not good. It's a bad practice. And you as a leader uh, uh, indulging in that kind of practice, it, it doesn't show respect. You have to be accountable. You don't, you don't the, 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 the boss does not have to wait to get update from you. You are the one to keep giving them update of what you are doing. So this is what he's saying here. That the rest of the Old Testament was often mined by pro-slavery Politics. You see, one thing is how does the, the New Testament or the Old Testament misinterpreted by, by the American people, by, by, by the European, by, by, by the people that are uh, uh, pro-slave, slavery people. For example, proving that slavery was common among the Israelites. Yes, we know that. But the New Testament was largely ignored except in the negative sense of pointing out that nowhere did Jesus condemn slavery. The people that were uh, uh, pro-slavery, they said there was no fear yeah, that Jesus condemned slavery. Although the story of Philemon, the runaway who St. Paul returned to his master was often, was often quoted. It was also generally accepted that the Latin word servus usually translated as servant really meant slave. So that is what I said. Is there any difference between slave and servant? But even though they said Jesus Christ did not mention anything about, about servanthood, but if you still remember, Jesus Christ said it. He, he said, I, I do not, I no longer call you slave. I do not, I do, I do no longer call you servant. If you if you remember that 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 I call you now friends, because a servant does not know what his master is doing. If you obey my commandment, is that not what Jesus Christ said? So, so, so what we are now saying is that they don't have any right to to <coughs> to, to say that that, that 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 Jesus Christ did not mention about slavery. So, 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 so that what we are now saying is that why did many Christians believe in slavery? Many Southern Christians felt that slavery, in one Baptist minister's word, 
stands out as an institution of God. Especially the Baptist people, they believe that slavery is an institution of God. And there are some so common arguments made by Christians at that time when, when, when slavery. Because I, I, I was able to see the, the a special Bible set aside for slaves. They, they divided the Bible into two, one for the white people, one for the, for, one for the black people. And then they said slavery was an institution of God. And then they give biblical reason for it. One of them was Abraham, the father of faith. And all the Petras had slave without God's disapproval. They said God did not disapprove Abraham having slave. As they told us in Genesis 21, 9 to 10, he said, But Sarah saw that the son whom Haggai, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. He said, but God did not disapprove of slavery. Too, they even went to, to, to court Canaan, the, the, the son of Ham, Ham's son. Ham's son was made a slave to his brothers in Genesis 9. If you still remember, after the, after the flood, Noah's children, they said Canaan saw his father's nakedness and, and he was cursed. So when Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cause be Canaan. The lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. So, so they said that, 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 that uh, and they tried to now, uh, 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 now, now use Canaan or Ham, uh, uh, I mean Canaan uh, as a black man. We are as, we are, we are as all, the, all, all the children of Noah, we are, we are all, uh, 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 of the same tribe. And then the Ten Commandments mentions slavery twice to showing God's implicit acceptance of it. As we read in Exodus 20, 10 and 17, he said, But the seventh day, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. So, so which means that they are saying, well, we can keep slave too because the, 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 the children of uh, God kept slave. So slavery was widespread throughout the Roman world and yet Jesus never spoke against it. Because Jesus, Jesus, Jesus existed when, when the Roman Empire was, in power, it was reigning. He didn't raise any objection against slavery. And then the Apostle Paul specifically commanded slaves to obey their masters as we have already read in Ephesians 6, 5 to 8. Uh, Paul returned a run away to Philemon to his masters, as we also read in Philemon. So these are all the, 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 the biblical reasons they gave to support slavery in America. But the, the, the evangelical people, they have their own reason too, which is a charitable reason. One of them is that slavery removed people from a culture that worship the devil. Practice witchcraft, so sorcery, and other evils. Can you believe it? So they brought Christianity to take us as slaves. Yes, sir. Yes. So just um, um, observation. Yeah. Okay. Um, as you were talking about um, submission. Yep. Um, and uh, as you clearly and eloquently explained about, uh, you explained about slavery. Uh, the submission, but at the same time, we talked about various characters in the Bible who were very submissive. Um, we talked about um, Joseph, we talked about uh, Daniel, and of course Noah, who was also very faithful and um, submissive, even in the face of um, faithlessness, he was very faithful and you know very focused. But and also. Um, uh, earlier, we talked about um, the um, the head of the church, you know, um, the overseer, and we talked about Christ being the head of the church, and also the husband being the head of the home, and how um, the wife should submit, and uh, the pastor should submit, and the fellowship, the fellowship church should also submit. So we've talked about all of that, but the 
point that I wanted to um, probably you could throw some lights or anyone could throw some lights on is the part where you know we have a woman and a husband. You have a husband who is abusive to a woman, and I know that in some uh, Christian uh, denomination, of course, divorce is it's a no, it's a no go, it's a no no, it doesn't happen. In fact, they are very very um, uh, very very strict on that that there is no separation. And you do have other denominations where it's acceptable. But in the context that we are talking now, how should a Christian handle a situation where a wife is married to a husband? And the Bible says a woman should submit. But here you have a man, a husband, who is very abusive. And the woman is, you know, brings that case to the church about what they're going through. The church is trying, but the situation does not so maybe even the woman, the man is not uh, you know, someone who is a believer. How do we handle it in the context of the world? Thank you so much. Actually, we have had so many cases of that before and um, what the Bible says is that if a, a, a believer, a, a woman married an unbeliever husband, it, that she she owes the the she owes God the obligation to to be able to convert the unbeliever husband through her behavior, in prayer, in submission, in in in, in, in what she does. That through her uh, goodness, the husband may change, and vice versa. If a believer husband marries a cantankerous woman, that but before you say one, she says two. And once a once because to, today we have women. Before you say one thing, they raise up their hand to slap you. When when it gets to that stage, what do you do as a husband when your wife slaps you? You're going to slap back? You're going to choke her? Because sometimes we, 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 get, we, we, we make a mistake. When we, during the courtship, she's the best, she's the, she's, the, she's, the, she's the Cinderella. But the moment that ring enters her finger, you get a Jezebel in your house. What do you do? Are you going to hop in marriage and hop out again? And that's why they say fools rushing where angels fear to tread. But once you have made that mistake, what do you do? And that's where the church comes in. Because it's not a, it's not a, 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 a situation where a man can handle, or not a situation where a woman can handle when, when she's married to an abusive husband. But unfortunately, the church cannot even help when, when the church when the husband is not a believer, because he will not come. So now the pastor too has a role to play by visiting the home and pray to God before we even go in there, otherwise he could get kicked out. He will pray to God. Yes, he will pray to God for him to be admitted. So so, so God is God that is going to speak through him to be able to calm down the, 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 the horrible husband. Because we read it also in the Bible, like I've already said, that Abigail was married to Naba. And Naba was a horrible man, a brute. That that, kind, uh, that uh, David was going to slaughter him together with all the male in his house. But Abigail rushed out to go and meet David. But God punished, Ab um, God punished Naba. Because as he was trying to, to beat Abigail, he, he had a heart attack and, and died. But we are not praying that somebody's husband should die. But what are we going to do if we don't want to end up in divorce, in divorce court? So that is why patience, because our own, our own mothers or our, our own grandmother, they didn't have bed of roses in their marriage life, especially in polygamous homes. 
but they endure. They endure. Some of them were neglected by the by the by, by forefather in present to, to, to the young wife that he has. They refused to give him give her, her allowance and everything was spit it upon. But because of her children in that house, she knows that if she packs out, her children will become slaves. So she had to endure. So this is where we are now coming now. Because I wouldn't say my grandmother was a Christian that she endured it because she's a Christian. No. But because traditionally she has to endure as a wife, as an African wife. It is now that we, we become a jet age wife that we, that we rush to divorce court at the slightest provocation. So endurance is one of the, the, the main factors that she must have. And the background too from where she's coming. I'm not saying that she should be stupid or she should be she should be a, 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 a punching bag. No. But I don't know, maybe Pastor Mana is, is, is a married counselor, I'm not. So maybe he can come to our rescue here. <laughs> Pastor Mana, can you hear Paul, sir? Thank you so much, sir. Well, uh, Dr. Elder Osman, what is your own intake?
it's um it's for me it's a difficult uh, um scenario you know, because um we have to submit even as, as authority as the Bible says, but um, as uh, this man alluded earlier to Daniel, when King Nebuchadnezzar went off the rebels, he there is a limit to that submission. And once he, he went, he got he, he got to a point where he's now challenging God. Then at that point, you have to take a different path. Your submission ends at that point. That's true. Likewise, Joseph, mm-hmm. when Potiphar tried to seduce him into doing something that is not right in the sight of God, at that point, submission ends. So, but the, the, the challenge with the situation with the wife and the husband is not just about the husband, the wife now sub- submits to the husband, the husband, the wife can refuse now to submit when the husband started acting in a way that is not right in the sight of God. But then there is a next challenge, which is the marriage is consummated. If this persists, this behavior persists for time, consistently, what does the woman do? Because in the case of Nabal, as the example earlier, you know, from reading that passage, you probably realize that um, Abigail had some some power there. Because even in the situation where you know, David um, had to, um, I mean, I mean, David declared war on Abigail's and Nabal's um, uh, family yep. and you know his, all his uh, entourage. Abigail was able to summon the servants, the some of the other um, uh, king or whatever uh, community individuals to move to take food to carry things. So she had some authority within the household to be able to do that without neighbor knowing. So which means she had some authority to even command those people to go with all that the food that they took to meet David in the wilderness. But in some homes where you have men that are so brutal, so you know, the wife feels you know, don't feel empowered to do anything. And people may not even listen to her, you know, because of the fear of what might happen to all of them if um, the, you know, the husband should find out what had happened. You know, so, but the question there is that I'm struggling with, what in terms of the marriage, you know, and not in that union. Whether we have any reference of political reference that makes the annulment of the, the union itself acceptable when things get that far. Yeah, I think that's the point that I um, I can't. No, I think we have because because uh, it, it was written that uh, if uh, a, a, a believer uh, woman married an unbeliever husband uh, and, 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 uh, and she, she tried her best but, but the man remain uh, evil that, that uh, the, the marriage could be annulled with, without that woman uh, being guilty of adultery and, and if a, a believer husband also married a woman that is cantankerous and and it's, it's an evil woman. The man can still, uh, uh, after trying his best, but even the, but it is in the New Testament that they were saying that uh, that uh, 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 that whatever man whatever man has joined together, let no man lay asunder. 
that that a man will come to a woman they become one flesh and, and anybody that that um, uh, divorces his wife make her an adulteress and anybody that married a divorced woman also marry an adult or commit adultery or fornication but um that is what the new testament said uh, and they said jesus christ uh, supported it but um uh, how do we now uh, 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 draw a line or how do we uh, uh, be, marry the old testament and the new testament together because one thing it, it, it's a um, god god saw the, the problems of what you have just raised in, in every marital home before, before he decreed through moses this this solution before jesus christ came and how are we now sure that jesus christ, jesus christ was the one that ordained what the new testament is now saying because obviously if you not allow your own daughter to stay in a, in, a, in a marriage where her life is in danger because because there are something that some, sometimes is more more worse than physical abuse psychological abuse emotional abuse and all these things they can they can easily kill any woman and if your own daughter is in that situation and the man is not is not repentant is getting worse is taking advantage of the fact that your daughter is a christian and your daughter continues to submit continue to submit because one thing is if, if you are if you are lucky to, to 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 get married to a bully a bully does not want you to be submissive a bully takes advantage of your of your of your of your of your gen of your of your submission it takes it as, as weakness and when they bully now mis mis misappreciate your 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 gentility let me put it that way as weakness he cherries her on it he takes advantage of it and what do you do do you do you allow your daughter to die or you find a way out so so this, this is a, a kind of a moral decision that that is between you and your god and no pastor can tell you what to do and the same thing it's the same thing if your or your own son is married to, to such a, a woman that 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 uh, is going to kill him at any time what do you do you stay in that marriage so 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 like i said it's also a decision you have to make after uh, with, with your with, i mean depending on your conscience with god i don't know but that that is what i would do <sighs>
That's right. You know, because if you don't have something goes wrong, God forbid, you know, one of them, you know, was somebody, because sometimes the abuse itself can get so mad, I know that, you know, does something crazy to the abuse as well. That is true. And so they touch me about it, they didn't do anything. There's not something we just, you know, if it gets to that point, then we'll bring in professional counselors and people to come in and actually look into that matter. That's so right. I personally would not die for somebody abusing his wife, and I just said, you know, God does not like That is true. And if I get to that stage, we intervene. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much. God will help us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lusman, for bringing up the Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> we are blessed tonight. <laughs> Any other question? <laughs> <laughs> Can you close the prayer for us, please, sir? <laughs> Thank God. Okay, Pastor Nana, can you pray for us? Thank you. Can you, can you, can you close the prayer for us, sir? the grace together. May the grace, grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest in name and abide with us all now forevermore. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow all all the days of our lives and we shall do in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.